Oh, this morning we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be reading chapter 1, verses 16 through 22. If you have your Bibles, you'll be able to find that on page 836 of your pew Bibles. Hear the Word of God. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he, that is Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Well, as you saw in the children's sermon this morning, doorbells and telephone chimes, and even some email programs have something very much in common. They all tell us that somebody is trying to reach us. And generally speaking, we do something a little more than just be quiet. Generally speaking, we do our dead level best to get to whatever is ringing and answer that thing. I can remember falling over a kitchen stool one time in the dark trying to get to a telephone that was ringing. I never did. I was nursing a sore shin for the next couple of days. But you know it's especially true with the doorbell or the phone. We just don't want to miss it. We can be in the middle of almost anything. And when we hear that bell, we drop it. We move. We start running. We're going to catch that call, whatever it is. And we might be talking to someone. We might be in the middle of dinner. We might be in the middle of a project. We might be sound asleep. We might be taking a bath. But we're going to get to that phone, or we're going to try to. One minister, it's told, was visiting one of his church members. And he was one of these ministers that enjoyed, shall we say, the surprise attack. He would never call ahead before he just showed up on the doorstep. And he did this with one particular home. He knocked. He rang the bell. He could hear somebody inside rumbling around. He could hear a door shut. But nobody came to answer the doorbell. And nobody responded to his knock. He was a little bit irritated. So he took out his calling card. And on the back of it he wrote, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he left it on the door and went on home. Well, that Sunday after worship, people were going through the door, patting the minister on the head, telling him that was a good sermon, that was a good sermon, that was a good sermon. Well, somebody pressed something into his, his hand, and uh, he didn't read it right then. He stuffed it in his coat pocket. And as he got home, he pulled it out and looked at it, and it was the, the wife of the family that he, was, he had gone to visit that day. And on the back of this piece of paper, she had scrawled, let's see if I can get this right, I heard you walking in the garden, and I hid myself, for I was naked. <laughs> you know, but generally speaking, when there's a knock or a doorbell or a telephone call, we do our best to get there. We might go with water dripping out of our hair. We might go with food still hanging on our chin, but we're going to do our best to get there. We have before us today a story of a call. And there are a lot of similarities to the calls that we get. This particular call happened around in the area of the little city at the, the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee known as Capernaum. As cities go, it was the only city on that end of the Sea of Galilee. And we had the privilege when I was in the, the Holy Land to go there and see the ruins of the city of Capernaum. And it, it was absolutely amazing. The things that you can see and understand where, when you're actually standing there. And it was absolutely fascinating. Now, this little city of Capernaum was a lot like most of the little Jewish cities of that day. The synagogue was the center of activity. And there in the middle of Capernaum was the ruins of the old synagogue. 
And you could actually see the benches and the pillars that are there. And you could actually envision the story of, of Jesus sitting in the synagogue in Capernaum saying, this day these scriptures are being fulfilled in your midst when he had read from the, the prophet Isaiah. But it was the prominent city on that end. The synagogue was right there. And everything kind of centered right around the synagogue. Well, when you stop and think about the area, you begin to get a little bit more understanding of what it's like. That northern end of the Sea of Galilee was a very fertile area. Obviously, they've got the water from the Sea of Galilee, but they're right there at the foot of the mountains that rise up very shortly out of the city and out of, you know, off the, uh, the, the lake plain that's right there. And so there were a lot of crops being grown, and it was lush. It was green when everything else around was just as barren and dry and brown as it could be. So we can pretty well figure Capernaum had two pr primary activities. The first one would have been fishing. It was right there on the lake shore, and a lot of people fished. And it was probably the place where a lot of those who were in the agricultural industry would bring a lot of their wares to sell to the, the city folks. So there were probably those two primary activities. And it's probably feasible for us to think then that Caper Capernaum was just a little bit more than a village. So as Jesus walked along, he saw these two men tending their nets, fishing taking part in that part of the town's primary economic activity. And he looked at him and said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now some of us might have heard this story a hundred times, but today I'd like for us to look at it just a little bit different. Today I'd like for us to take just a, a new look at this old story. And what we've got here is indeed a call, very similar to our telephone ringing or our email saying, you've got mail, or the doorbell ringing. Because here we have a transforming call, a compelling call, a personal call. Now notice what Jesus said to Peter and Andrew. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, they were already fishermen. They were fishing for fish. But they understood this business of fishing. They knew how to do it. They knew how to cast a net. They knew how to care for their nets and their boats and their other fishing gear. They were well aware of what that took. But Jesus was telling them, follow me, and I'm going to transform what you do to be for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. He was changing their objective. That was the transforming call. As followers of Jesus, as his disciples, he would train them to fish for men. And Jesus was saying, follow me, and I'll take what you do, and I'll apply it to ministry for the benefit and for the building up of the kingdom of God. That was the transforming call. And it was a compelling call. They understood this rabbinical tradition. A rabbi would come through, an itinerant traveling rabbi, and he would say, I want you to become my disciples. In Jesus' case, he was saying, follow me. And they understood what that meant. They understood this teacher, this rabbi, was calling them to be part of his following his disciples and he was calling them out of their daily activity out of their usual routine out of their place of belonging to go and follow him and they understood that they would be traveling together kind of like a roving classroom and that the teaching method was going to be like a long constant conversation but here were these two fishermen, mending their nets, casting their nets, whatever they were doing at the moment. And Jesus was saying, stop doing that. Come do this. And I will transform your fishing for men, or fishing for fish into fishing for men for the glory of God. 
Now, we often think Jesus was a poor carpenter. How many times have you heard those two words put together? A poor carpenter. Carpenters in that day and age made good money, especially when they lived in Nazareth, because that was the cadre. That was the group of people, the Roman Empire, the Romans there occupying the land would draw their workers from to build their luxury city. So it's quite probable that Jesus' father, Joseph, and possibly also Jesus, were in that group of laborers that went to work for the Roman Empire doing the carpentry work that was necessary for the building of that city. Now you stop and think about these, quote, poor fishermen. I think that's a misnomer too. You know, when you stop and think about Capernaum, and we talked about that a minute ago, it, it was right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. The synagogue was there. And like most cities of olden day America, most anybody who was anybody lived uptown. They were within that hub of activity right around the synagogue, which was the center of town. And that was the upper crust of the city's society. Well, get this. Standing in front of the synagogue, you can look three doors down. And right on the edge of the shore of the Sea of Galilee, that was Peter's house. He wasn't a poor fella. He had a thriving business. His family owned this business. His father was probably going to pass it down to his sons. Peter and Andrew. And so when he comes right down to it, they were not just poor fishermen. They had something going. They were economically secure. They were a prominent family in town. They were educated. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Well, let's do it now. You stop and think about Peter. He wrote First and Second Peter in our New Testament. When you read through that, you realize, hey, this, quote, poor fisherman wasn't poor at all. He was educated. He could read and write. In fact, he had a way of phrasing things that was just amazing. He, he was an intelligent fella. And this is the guy. These were the guys, Peter and Andrew, that Jesus was calling, saying, come and follow me. And we have every reason to believe that they were going to be leaving behind something significant. It wasn't a, hey, follow me and I'm going to give you a better station in life. It was a, hey, I want you to leave that. I know you're comfortable, you like it, you're well respected in the community, you've got a lot going for you, but I want you to come and travel with me and I'm going to be your rabbi. They had to leave something significant in order to go and follow Jesus. There's strong evidence that Peter and Andrew were not just poor fishermen. Something compelling was going on here. So when Jesus called them, they went. Now they were not going because of the promise of a better life. They were going because they recognized Jesus had something to offer. The Lord had called, and we're told, straightway. In other words, they didn't mince any words. They left their nets and followed him. There was no hesitation. There was no, well, let me think about it. Or as we get sometimes when we go and ask somebody in the church to fill a position, well, I think I'll go and pray about it. I have a colleague in the minister in the ministry that you know, would hear that, he, he's dead now, but, you know, there, there are others like him. He would hear, well, let me go home and pray about it. And he said, let's bow and pray right now. There was none of this, well, let me run a few projections and talk to a few people and, and I'll get back to you. No, there was no, how long will I have to serve? Jesus, how long am I going to be following you? And there was none of this, well, why didn't you call last week? I had time last week. Well, why don't you wait till next week? I, I think my calendar might be a little clearer then. The Lord had called. And there were no second thoughts. They obeyed 
immediately, straightway. The same thing happened with James and John. And there, Mark tells us, they left their father, they left their boats, they left their nets, and they followed. Now, we don't know if there was someone around to put things up or not. We know with James and John there were because they left their father and the servants. By the way, James and John, they had a good enough business to where they could hire on help. These guys were doing pretty good. These men were leaving behind healthy businesses, stations of social prominence, homes, because of the compelling call of Jesus Christ. And they obeyed. And they had no way of knowing how wonderful it would be that they did get up and go and follow straightway. We know today because his sacrificial death on the cross for our sin and his resurrection has already happened. We can look back on these events across Calvary's Hill with a whole lot more understanding. They didn't know that then. They just knew he was going to teach them. And it was a personal call. Jesus was specific. Now the Bible doesn't tell us how he let them know. You, you can see it in particular with James and John. They were there with their father. They were there with their hired hands. They were in the boat. They were mending their nets. They were taking care of things. And Jesus came and called James and John. We don't know if he pointed at them, said you and you, or if he looked at them, or if they just knew. But they understood it was personal. It was directed specifically at them. They were called, not their father, not the hired hands that were there with them in the boat. It was something then that they and they alone had to consider. It was up to them and what was taking place in their heart right then at that moment that they had to deal with. And nobody but them could respond to Jesus. You know, we have to wonder, though, if... Peter and Andrew, James and John might have looked over at their father and said to themselves, I, I wonder what it's going to be like for him to have to do this by himself. I wonder if he's going to have anybody helping. Did Peter and Andrew glance up toward their house? It was just off the shore. I'm sure they could see their house from right there and think, wow, I have to leave my home for I don't know how long. Follow this itinerant preacher, this this rabbi, I don't even know where we're going. What about their families? What about their pets, their livestock? What about that which means so much to anybody in any day and age? Their homes, their livelihoods, their relationships, their, their place of belonging, their plans. None of that. Straightway, they got up and followed their heart immediately had been moved and they responded accordingly. Straightway. It was a personal response to a personal call and they forsook everything to get up and go right then. And the call of Jesus comes to you and me today today, right now. And just as it's always been, that call to us is just as transforming, just as compelling, and just as personal. He may or may not want us to change what we do, but he does want to transform what we do that it might be for the glory of God and the building up of the kingdom of God. He wants to transform our objective. If we're a teacher, he wants us to teach for the glory of God. If we're a doctor, he wants us to practice for the glory of God. If we're a plumber, he wants us to plumb for the glory of God. I'm trying to pick, pick things here that are not going to step on any particular toes if we're a parent or a child or a student or a football player or a soccer player, he wants us to do it for the glory of God. 
for the building up of the kingdom of God. If we're an elder or a deacon, he wants us to eld or deek for the glory of God according to the will and the word of God. Whatever we do, he calls us and the question is, will we straightway follow? We do this not out of some sense of burdened coercion. We have a much better reason. We do it because he's already loved us with an unspeakable love. So much so that he offered himself as a sacrifice for sins that we've done. Allowing himself to be ridiculed, beaten, and nailed to a cross. Giving everything, including his good name and reputation. People lying against him. Even his very life was taken from him. And he did that for you and me. I think that deserves some kind of response, don't you? And we recognize that God is a provident God. Everything we enjoy is a gift from his mighty hand. I think that deserves a response from me and you. Don't you? You see, his call to us is far more meaningful than it was to his disciples there at the first of his ministry. He called them and they didn't know the cross lay ahead. He calls us, we know the cross lies behind in history. But he calls us to take up our cross and follow him. And so it is that nowadays, looking back across the top of Calvary's hill, we know that he is worthy of every devotion for what he's done for us. We know he's worthy of our love because of that great love with which he loved us. We know that he deserves a fitting response for the life he poured out for us. And so indeed, we are compelled by nothing short of his sacrificial love. Unless, of course, we don't recognize that. Or unless, of course, we are ruled by reluctance or halted by hesitance or stopped by doubt. And Jesus is calling, calling today. Jesus is calling each of us today. And maybe he's asking us any number of things to give up a pet sin, to forgive a wrong. Maybe that wrong happened years ago. Maybe it's a relationship that we just keep nursing, holding a little bit of a grudge because it just feels familiar. Maybe he's calling us to recognize salvation and what he's done for us. Maybe he's calling us to leave something dear behind. Maybe he's calling us to forsake something valuable. Maybe he's even asking us to change our plans. Maybe he's asking us to absorb something inconvenient, like reading our Bible, maybe just five minutes a week, or tithing, one-tenth of all he's provided for us. Maybe he's calling us to place our trust in him alone instead of in ourselves and in our own prideful, sinful ways. But he's calling. And it's something he has for each one of us. The question is, will we follow? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the good gift of a Savior. We thank you that you not only provided the Savior, 
but that you were the Savior in the sending of your only begotten Son. We pray that your Holy Spirit might open our hearts and minds this day, that we might respond to the call you have for each one of us. We know it's a personal call. We know it. We know there are things we ought to be doing that they are your will. We understand it from your word. Sometimes we even feel guilty because we know that we are not responding as you would have us to respond. But Lord, seize our hearts this day that we might not only experience you, but that we may embrace the gladness of serving you, that we might be of benefit to the one who gave all, that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.